Um, uh, just was reading this Psalms. I know Abraham was mentioned in it. I was kind of looking at it. Um, it says that um, Psalms 47, Psalms chapter 47, verse one says to the chief musician, a song for the sons of Korah. And it says, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto Elohim with the voice of triumph. For the Most High Yah, I was interested, it actually says Most High there. You know, a lot of places don't really say Most High. That's how we get the word El Yon and elevation or lofty supreme. And that's why we say um, El El Yon, which means God Most High or, um, you know, supreme Elohim in a way. But for El El Yon Yahuwah is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. And the word here for terrible is really, um, he is to be feared, he is to be revered. Um, not terrible in a bad sense. That's actually a bad translation the way that she is. But he is a great king over all the earth. Hallelujah. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. Well, you can't say that to nobody. <laughs> Hey, you say that to somebody, it's like, man, no, it's about the church and everybody. You can't even say that scripture to nobody. That's on one side. And then you can't even really break that scripture down with Israelites because they'll use that scripture to tell you. Everybody else show. Salvation ain't come to the world. It's just for Israel. Everybody else gonna die. <laughs> Oh man, everybody else gonna be handmaids and servants in the kingdom, let them tell it. Yeah. It ain't no way in hell you could tell me that 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 Job or Job from the book of Job, he ain't gonna be nobody's servant and he ain't no Israelite. I just don't see him being no servant. I mean, maybe. I mean, I'm sure somebody could try to twist some scripture some way to do it, but I don't see him being nobody's servant. I don't see, I don't, I don't see, uh, I don't see Ruth being nobody's servant. I'm just saying. I don't see Bathsheba's husband who David sent to war to die when he was trying to take her for war. What was his name? Uriah. I just don't see him being nobody's servant. I'm just saying, especially not no Negroes today. Uh, <laughs> traveling over the word how we be. But he did say in chapter 47, verse 3, he shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. Hallelujah. He shall choose our, our inheritance for us. That's an interesting scripture. Yah's going to choose it for us. It ain't for us to choose. The excellency of Yaakov, whom he loved. Selah. Pause. Elohim is going up with a shout. The Most High with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to Yahuwah, sing praises, sing praises unto our king, sing praises. That's an interesting scripture too. For the most high is the king of all the earth. Sing you praises with understanding. That's interesting. Don't just be around here singing and acting like you praising. You got to do it with understanding. You got to know, you got to know what you're talking about. You got to know who you're talking to. You got to know who you're referencing. I think that's dope. Verse eight, the most high reign over the heathen. Hallelujah. Yahuwah sitteth upon the throne of his holiness and he never leave it. That's why when we pray as we're about to pray, you know, we humble ourselves to go into the throne room of our father, Abiyah. And we, you know, try to do it in, 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 with humility and humbleness. In all respect. Hallelujah. Verse 9. The princes of the people are gathered together. Even the people of the Elohim of Abraham. So he like, the princes of the people are gathered together. 
for the shields of the earth belong to Elohim. He is greatly exalted. The shields of the earth belong to Elohim. He is greatly exalted. The word there for shield is Magan or um, Megana. It says a shield, the small one or a buckler, a protector, also the scaly hide of the crocodile which I can see them probably making shields out of that back in the day, especially in Egypt, the crocodiles in the Nile. Armed buckler, defense, ruler, scale shield, he's saying. The protector of the earth belongs unto Yah, the, the defense, the ruler. Hallelujah, the shield. He is greatly exalted. It is Yah who shields this earth. It is, it is as they say, it's a hole in the ozone layer and it's got the sun coming in and the planet getting hot. Nah, ain't ozone layer. <laughs> Yah is the shield of the earth. And because of the way man moving, he didn't let a little bit more sun come down to show you that just that simple, I can eradicate all y'all. Hallelujah. As we go into prayer, <sighs> after reading that, we just sing praises. I'll be, I, we thank you first and foremost for, sh for giving us the understanding to properly sing praise and to properly give thanks and to, um, just properly do all things with decency and in order. We acknowledge you to be the protector or the shield of the earth. I'll be, I, we humbly come before your throne and just thank you for um, providing the water in the air. Um, providing the things that we can't even uh, account for, I'll be out for. We know that all things are in your hand. We thank you for allowing us to gather in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. We pray that he is in the midst and understanding uh, and understanding will be abound um, as your Ruach HaKodesh reveals to us what it is that you want us to see. We pray, I'll be out for be your holy will that we all continue to be at a function with focus and wholeness and, and sound minds. Um, as we continue, as, as, as you, we pray that you continue to give us the focus to sacrifice more of ourselves daily, um, to do right by your Torah, to do right by your word, and to do right by all things that you have um, in your mercy presented before us. We thank you for being called. We thank you for being the children of the covenant, I'll be out. Uh, and we thank you for the opportunity to um, hold up our end of the bargain. Most of us haven't been lost in this world of, of, of confusion and darkness, as the scriptures say. Um, but you shined a ray of light upon us in a cloudy, dark world. Um, and you showed us that it was much more to our existence. And we just thank you for that opportunity to live up to our end of that bargain um, in the hopes that. In the end, we'll be counted worthy um, and that we perform as, as vessels that you can delight in. In the name of Yahushua HaMashiach, we pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Shalom, shalom, everyone. Shalom, Mark. Hallelujah. So in Jasher chapter 22, <clears throat> I think we were in hmm, Genesis was this. I had this uh, chapter five of verse six. Uh, that's probably there. Yeah, I must run somewhere. We're going to see some differences. So we ended last time with in chapter 21, verse 47. And he spoke these words to me when Ishmael, thy husband. Okay, this was when Abraham was going to see Ishmael. And um, he told him how his first wife was out of order. His second wife, he was delighted in. He told him to um, keep the tent peg because it was it was a secure tent peg for the house, um, which I still think is funny. He told him, you got to get your vibe right. <laughs> That's just sound like something smooth that we would say, man. You got to get your vibe right. Huh? <laughs> but and Ishmael listened and they say, um, Ishmael knew that it was his father and that his wife had honored him and, and Yahuwah blessed Ishmael for listening to his father. Because we remember um, 
it hasn't been said here. Like, you know, when, 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 when Moses and all of them were coming out of Egypt in Exodus, um, Yah specifically said that um, Moses would be like an Elohim to the people. Well, uh, I can't think of as a scripture that specifically said that about Abraham, but Yah is using Abraham the same way, which is why when he circumcised him, he had to circumcise his whole house because what he's showing Abraham is that to be in Yah's house, everybody has to be circumcised. Everybody got to be on the pay. So it's to be assumed that now, we also know that the devil was in Yah's house, who we called the oppressor or the adversary. And at a time, he would have been circumcised, right? But he fell from that, too. So we understand that that, at this point in life of, of the story of creation, um, that has been part of the house as well, and Yah had to move it around. Now, I say that because we know that in the end, like uh, when Hamashiach come back in a thousand years of... Um, peace and, and he's going to teach the people and there are going to be other people on the planet but not everybody's going to be in the new jerusalem as they say quote unquote um i'm just saying that there's coming a day when um there won't be any of that in yah's house there won't be any of that as part of yah's creation so as you see here because you're going to see something come up in this chapter that's a, a topic of debate and we'll we'll see how we all feel when we get to it but as we see here, um, as we see here, um, or I, I, I think it's safe to assume that everybody that's amongst Abraham, not all the travelers that's coming through, and we're going to see that too about his house, um, but everybody who is living amongst him, from the servants to family and all of that, everybody is being taught the ways of Yah. There is no teaching of other gods and other things around him and we can assume that because at every step the people who are with him are people who didn't just been like we believe in what you got going on we want to go with you from when nimrod and them except for eliezer i it, we don't know that eliezer wanted to go with him it was just like after he walked in the furnace nimrod was like you can have my top servant and gave him eliezer and somebody else um although i do believe eliezer um maybe not all the time but he has picked up on the word of yah we know Sarah, we know that Sarah taught Hagar. Um, and we have to assume that of all of um his servants in the apocalypse of Abraham, because Abraham has a multitude of books associated to him. You have an apocalypse of Abraham, you have like uh the life of Abraham, you have like um this multitude of books. Um, I can't think of them all. I know I think it's at least three. And they all tell different stories at different times. One of them talks about the death of Abraham, how the death angel came to him and he um Yah, when he was dying, Yah told the deaf angel when he go get Abraham, he had to do it in a, in a certain manner, and it was angels there with him, and, and it's actually a really beautiful story. Um, but in one of them, it talks about living with Abraham, and I know that there was a scripture in one of them that said that, because, you know, back then as a servant, you only really were somebody serving for like seven years. It wasn't a life sentence, and then now, if you had kids and different things as you were serving of a person, those children and your wife may even belong to whoever you were under. But once your seven years was up, you can leave. And it was up to that master if he said, you know, take your kids and your family with you. And, and I know it speaks that Abraham was like that. Whenever people would come up, he'd be like, you know, I ain't on that. You can take your family and your kids, them your people. Uh, may even give you cattle and things to start a new life. But in the scripture, and I think it's the apocalypse of Abraham that comes up, that and this is why I say you, we have to assume that everybody amongst Abraham was um, at least being taught in that way. Um, and for the most part, believe, because in that scripture, it talks about how when seven years would come up, Abraham would be telling them like, you know, that's on you, man. I'm gonna give you this and give you that. Thanks for helping us. You know, Abraham's that type of humble being. But a lot of the times the servants amongst Abraham is like, man, we don't want to leave. And Abraham would be like, well, you know, you can stay, but you got to work and keep and you got to keep your keep up, you know, just because you ain't a servant or nothing. You still got to hold up your end of the bargain and keep up your keep, but you can stay. And it just spoke about how a lot of the servants amongst Abraham, when it was their time, um, when their indentured servitude would be up with Abraham, a lot of them would be like, we don't want to leave, um, which speaks to the type of man that Abraham is. So. As we get here to, um, as we get here to um, chapter twenty-two, 
as we see that Ishmael listened and Yah blessed him because he listened to his father as he should have. As we start chapter 22, the very first verse says, and Ishmael then rose up and took his wife and his children and his cattle and all belonging to him, which may be a lot because Yah is blessing him. As we see, even when he was a child, Yah told Hagar, I'm going to bless him, make him a great nation. It says that, and he journeyed from there and went to his father in the land of the Philistines. So, and it's been a while. He left when he was 14. Um, we know last chapter said from the time that it said it was a very long time before Abraham even went to see him. And then he saw the bad wife and it was three years before he came back. So uh, Ishmael's definitely into his 20s, possibly his 30s now when he goes back. But we see just from his father coming, um, Ishmael, even though he's not the son of the covenant, you see a stark difference between him and Esau. Although he's not the son of the covenant, he still values the things that he has learned under his father. He still wants to be up under his father. Because it's saying he journeyed from there and went to his father in the land of the Philistines. After all of that, having not seen his father in so long, and he come first, tell him your wife out of order. Then he tell him you got a good wife. Ishmael like, I got to go see my daddy. Because Ishmael done missed him both times. He ain't been there. In verse two, it says, and Abraham related to Ishmael, his son, the transaction with the first wife that Ishmael took, according to what he said. So then he let him know exactly like this is why I said that. And Ishmael and his children dwelt with Abraham many days in that land. And Abraham dwelt in the land of the Philistines a long time. So Ishmael was there for a while. And many days, a lot of times when you read that, we, I, I assume it was years Ishmael was here. And say Abraham was in the land of the Philistines for a while. And we know he'd been bouncing around. He was in Gerar for a minute. He's going to be in Hebron for a minute. That may be coming up. Um, Abraham, he's been standing in these spots for some years, though. It's not like he's just going for a week and bouncing around. But he kind of been bouncing around what Yah has already told him. I'm going to get his land to your seed, though. So he kind of just been bouncing around it. And Yah been blessing him everywhere he go. Verse 4. It says, in the days increased and reached 26 years. So Abraham was amongst the Philistines for 26 years. Yitzhak had been born there. We read how um, when he weighed Yitzhak off the breast, they had a feast and Shem was there, Ebra was there. The king of Blimelech was there and his and his mighty men and princess um, Terah was there. Um, it said all of the princes of the land around were there. So like he threw this big feast that was uh, a, a big deal um, to show you how he's got acclimated to the climate. He's highly respected. Um, love really but it says and after that abraham with his servants and all belonging to him went from the land of the philistines and removed to a great distance so he moved and they came near to hebron so now he's in hebron and they remained there and the servants of abraham dug wells of water and abraham and all belonging to him dwelt by the water which we have to uh just to keep it in mind frame in this time you know now we just move in the plumbing home <laughs> Not not so back in this era. In this era, you know, it's um to dig a well and be able to find water would be a big deal. Wherever the water at is probably the biggest deal because the from the water is how you um keep the crops together or whatnot. The animals just, you know, water is essential in life, man. Uh, but it says Abraham was successful. He dug wells plural of water. And Abraham and all belonging to him dwelt by the water. And the servants of Abimelech, king of the Philistines, heard the report that Abraham's servants had dug wells of water in the borders of the land. So this area Abimelech had had to be big because it said Abraham went far away, but he's still by the borders of Abimelech's kingdom. Um, but Abimelech's servants heard about the wells. Mind you, the servants know that Abimelech thinks very highly of Abraham. And say, and they came and quarreled with the servants of Abraham. And they robbed them of the great well, which they had dug. So the water was important. And, you know, the crazy thing is the way Yah works is they probably could never find water in the whole valley or whatnot where they at. And then Abraham come through. Yah bless him, bring water straight out the ground. And they probably like, man, we've been out there forever. We could never even find no water. And they go take the well. 
because wherever the whale lettuce is just, you know, you build, and this time it's probably people who build cities around whales. Just because we could find a whale, we could build a city, a community around the whale. Without the whale, and if it ain't no river or nothing like that close, um, you can't really live nowhere with water at, and that's still true today. It's everywhere where there isn't clean water is almost uninhabitable. It's, there's people who suffer through that in places, but it's almost uninhabitable. So they came and stole this well from Abraham, which I'm surprised that y'all allowed that to happen. Uh, verse six, and Abimelech, king of the Philistines, heard of this affair, and he with Phico, the captain of his host, and 20 of his men came to Abraham. And Abimelech spoke to Abraham concerning his servants, and Abraham rebuked Abimelech concerning the will of which his servants had robbed him. So it get back to the king what happened. Now, mind you, it already said Abraham done went far. We know kings don't travel light. So he didn't got up with the army, servants, concubines, kids. For him to travel to find Abraham to really apologize, um, it shows how much, um, how highly he thinks of Abraham. Hey, um, Abraham didn't want to hear it. Um, Abraham didn't want to hear it, but Abimelech came to make it right, as you should, you know? I don't want Abraham thinking, I didn't, I, not that he didn't left from me, because remember when he was with him, with the situation when he took Hagar and Yah smited the whole, uh, his whole area that they in or whatnot, kingdom, I should say, you know, he gave him all his stuff, gave him whatever plot of the land, and it's known amongst these Philistines here that uh, he thinks very highly of Abraham. So when he when this happens, he going to let Abraham know, like, just because you moved, I ain't switched up. But Abraham don't want to hear. It. He rebuked him concerning the well of which his servants robbed him. So as we see to start off, Ishmael, he did travel with his father. Um, He's with his father now through this, at, with Sarah, with, I'm sure Hagar went with him. She back. Um, Yitzhak is born. Um, I said after 26 years too. So I know last chapter he was waning Yitzhak. I'm not sure the age he was waning him, but Yitzhak is probably in his 30s, which I take that back because Ishmael is 14 years older. So if Yitzhak in his 30s, Ishmael probably closer to 40 or 50. Um he probably been gone close to 30 years, something in the range. Um, but the family's back and they moving with Abraham and these people took this well from him. We're going to start there. Any questions or comments, anything anybody want to add on Jasher chapter 22, verses 1 through 6? Yeah, okay. 26 years, Abraham moving around and Yitzhak is born. So when we get to verse seven, when we get to verse seven, it says, and Abimelech said to Abraham, as Yahuwah live who created the whole earth. So just think, Abraham done rubbed off on Abimelech because when he first got there, remember he like telling Sarah, telling people you my, my sister. Remember he said when he went to Egypt, he did it because he felt like Yah wasn't in that place. So it makes us assume that he felt the same way about Abimelech and the Philistine. Yet when Abimelech come to him, we see that Abraham and the way he living and then rubbed off. Abimelech, like, as y'all live, who created the whole earth, I did not hear the act which my servants did unto thy servants unto this day. So he didn't swore. He didn't swore by Yah now. You know, you don't swear by Yah and be playing around. And Abraham took seven ewe lambs and gave them of Abimelech, saying, Take these, I pray thee from my hands that it may be a testimony for me that I dug this well. So he like, well, look, okay, I hear you swear by Yah. Take these lambs, these you. And I'm letting you know that by those seven lambs that I'm giving you, that's my testimony letting you know that I this, this was my well. This was my well. It says, and Abimelech took the seven you lambs, which Abraham had given him, for he had also given him cattle and herds in abundance. And Abimelech swore to Abraham concerning the will. Therefore, he called that will Beersheba, for there they both swore concerning it. And we know that Beersheba is.
right here. And we know that uh, Beersheba. Oh, Beersheba means uh, Bayer Sheba is well of an oath because they both made oaths here. He swore he didn't know, and Abraham swearing. Yeah, your people stole it. Whether you knew it or not, I don't know, but your people stole my will. And they made a covenant there, as it says. That's how you get Beersheba. So it just gave us a little history about how you got this place to be called Beersheba. And I'm sure it was called something else at another time. Um, you know, things change, but this is this is what Yah wanted it to be called out. So I, I believe I should say. Um, verse 10, it says, and they both made a covenant in Beersheba at the well of the oak. And Abimelech rose up with Phicol, the captain of his host, and all his men, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. And Abraham and all belonging to him dwelt in Beersheba, and he was in that land a long time. And Abraham planted a large grove in Beersheba. And he made it, and he made to it four gates facing the four sides of the earth, so north, south, east, west. And he planted a vineyard in it, so that if a traveler came to Abraham, he entered any gate which was in his road and remained there and ate and drank and satisfied himself and then departed. So, and you know, that's funny because when you read, um, there's an extra book about Job called The Testament of Job, where it gives detail. We actually may read that in here one day. I thought it was a really good read. But um, in there, Job gives, in there, Job gives detail to some of the things he was doing. As we know in the scripture, it talks about how Job was a righteous man and done all those things. And it details some of that. And Job's house was the same way. All the stuff y'all had blessed him with. I'm talking about even before the devil, y'all allowed the devil to take everything and he blessed him back in the end for staying righteous. But um Job's home was similar. It was always open. He would clothe anybody who would come. He would feed anybody who would come and said he had cooks that cooked all day. Same with Abraham, because mind you, we already discussed Abraham about 400 deep. And by this time, Abraham may be five, 600 deep. So when you're hearing that Abraham and his, everything belonging to him is moving, you're talking about, and now you got servants who didn't have kids. Like Abraham might be a thousand people strong when he's moving around like this. So you know, because when we hear these stories, we envisualize like these couple tents in this well. No, Abraham got like, this is a large plot of land. These is a lot of people. These tent, and these tents ain't just like teepees, like a lot of times they depict it as. Um, like these people are master tent makers and builders. Like these tents got rooms. Like these is, these is, uh, this is big. This is not like something little. This is a big thing. Right. And it says that he didn't bit he didn't built a, a grove, which is under this tree, and it's a vineyard, and he got a gate at each side. If you're coming from the west, the south, the east, or the north, you could come through the middle of where he stay. And it said that he whoever came, Abraham, he could remain there and eat, drink, and satisfy himself, and then departed. Verse 12. For the house of Abraham was always open to the sons of men that passed and repassed who came daily to eat and drink in the house of Abraham. Now, Abraham had his house open to everybody. Mind you, ain't Israel yet. Abraham and his lineage ain't made it that far. But it says Abraham had his house open to everybody, whoever. He will feed you, clothe you. We're going to get to that. He will let you drink. You know, you're traveling with your family. You know, mind you, people back then is typically not traveling alone. You're moving around. You got family. You got servants. You got cattle. You need help with all of that. You know what I mean? Uh, you could come get water for your, your your camels or I don't know if they would even be riding horses at this time, but maybe. But however you're moving around, you could water, you know. Abraham got people with wrenches around. Man, they fixing chariots for people. You done blew a wheel on your chariot. You can come, you know. Abraham got it. You come get right. He don't want nothing. He's giving back the blessing that Yah has given him. This is all. Matter of fact, now that I think about it, it just dawned on me. This is really Abraham tithing. 
ain't no temple. Ain't nowhere to go give no tithe to Yah. He gave it to Melchizedek because he was blessed by him with the word of Yah, right? But we also know that with the tithe, is going to do something to the poor. It's like a free will offering for Yah. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's an alm, I think people would call it. So in truth, this is kind of like Abraham's way of tithing slash giving alms by doing this. Yah done blessed him abundantly. We know that Abraham is quite possibly the richest man. It don't say that, but we just know from the way that it's been broken down. Too many kings that say them blessed him with too much stuff. Nimrod blessed him with a bunch. Abimelech blessed him with a bunch. Um, what's his name? The king of Egypt, when all that happened with Sarah down there, say blessed him with a bunch. Aside from that, um, which that's all y'all too, but aside from that, um, Yah is blessing him. He all he keeping plentiful land, which is helping the cattle grow bigger. I'm sure. I'm sure. Pro, I could just hear him. Uh, you know how you hear rumors, man. I could just hear being a rumor saying, "Man, Abraham got the most perfect cattle, perfect sheep, perfect lambs. You know, is you know everywhere he post up, his crops is the best, and he ain't got nothing for sale." I could see me and being a little mad at that. Like, man, Abraham won't even sell you nothing. But if you go up there and you hurting and just ask, he give you a lamb. <laughs> and I can see people saying that, especially the people of the world, like that's crazy. He don't need y'all to make no money off all that stuff. But we watch him give poor people lambs and cattle, fill up their water. You know them whales he built, y'all didn't put, you know y'all didn't got it and where to put them whales at. Even out them whales, I'm assuming is the best water in the world coming through them whales. Matter of fact, I know because y'all is choosing Abraham out this time. And we know water is representation of the word. And in truth, at this time, he's establishing Abraham as the authority. He's given Abraham the authority to establish the word of Yah at this time on the planet. I'm standing on that water is the best water. Everything around Abraham is just the best. Once you got the best cattle, that means these clothes that he given to these poor people and clothing them is the best. He giving them the best sandals, the best coats, the best pants. Everything, everything, which is why his servants don't want to leave. When they free, they like, ah, we ain't going nowhere. We still work for our little pay. Ain't nowhere for me to go. Verse 13 saying, any man who had hunger and came to Abraham's house, and this is him really giving an arm. This is his tie. You know, I ain't around Melchizedek every day. That say it was Shem, it says in here. I know people debate that. Um, hallelujah, that's worthy debate, I guess. Uh, that's something worth a uh, conversation, things like that. Um, but this is Abraham giving his tithe. This is his all. This is him showing Yah that he's thankful for what he did. And we know Yahushua said it himself. When you feed the hungry, you fed me. When you clothe those who don't have anything, you've done the same to me. So Abraham is really, Abraham is really showing that, you know, his behavior is the type of behavior that's going to get you into the kingdom. Said he, any man who hungered and came to Abraham's house, Abraham would give him bread that he might eat and drink and be satisfied. And anyone that came naked to his house, he would clothe with garments as he might choose. And he gave him silver and gold and make known to him Yahuwah who had created him in the earth. This did Abraham all his days. See, he's establishing the word. Now, you know, word is around, man. You go to Abraham's house, he is blessing everybody. I'm sure. Egypt probably was Kemet or probably Mitzrayim at that time, but it wasn't called Egypt like we call it today, Aki. But he's establishing the word of Yah at this time. And you know how word of mouth is. Like my aunt just asked about Egypt. Excuse me. This word then got all the way to Egypt to the furthest reaches of civilization that if you ain't got nothing, get up to Abraham's house. Like, I see Abraham as that house. As you know how when you were a kid, you got that favorite auntie? <laughs> or, you know what I mean? You got that certain granny who house you always want to go through because it's always, you know, just love. They always got you or whatever. I'm sure Abraham is viewed like that. Mind you, at this time, you're looking at Abraham being around 130. <laughs> he up there. He had, he had Yitzhak at, at, at 100, and I'm assuming Yitzhak is in the range of 30 right here. Abraham like 130. He OG status now, grandpa. 
I could just imagine everybody, man, the kids asking their people when they travel off, when are we going back to Abraham's house? Man, we ain't going back to Abraham's house. Why? <laughs> no Abraham showing love to the kids. He giving you silver and gold when you come through. Oh, y'all ain't got no money. Look, y'all going that way. I know when you get to that city. Um, mind you, Sodom and Gomorrah have been destroyed, so it ain't really no more cities where they just raping you all your money and watching you starve out. So people trading. Look, man, when you get to that city, I know you're hurting. I know y'all got a long distance. You're going to pass that city. You're going to pass that city. You got enough silver and gold that when you get there, it won't nobody help you. At least you can buy your essentials you need in them cities to get to where you're going. Abraham that. Abraham that. But it's say that he make it known to everybody who Yah is, which is the most important thing he's doing. This is how the word is traveling. So this is how, this is how a lot of times when um especially when this years go on, because Yah does this again when he bringing Moses and them out of Egypt. He's establishing his name in the earth, right? Which, mind you, we know, we just talked about it. Abraham was born about 290 to 300 years after the flood. He's now about 100, 130. He's, this is about 430 years from the flood. And a lot of people who've been born after the flood, um, um, a lot of the first age people, because we know, People directly born after the flood, like um, our Foxit and um, Cush and the kids of Ham, Shem, and Yafeth, Gomer. Uh, we know that Shem lived 400 and some years after the flood because he's still alive. So what I'm saying is, is the name of Yah is known. But because of Nimrod and Babel and the tower, the confusion of the languages are being spread around. Something's been lost. And Yah is using Abraham in this moment with all these travelers that he's reestablishing his name on the planet. And this is what it looked like. And it said Abraham did this his whole life. He was never slack. And Abraham and his children and all belonging to him dwelt in Beersheba. And he pitched his tent as far as Hebron. Hebron is important. If I'm not mistaken, one of you could correct me or wrong, but I know one of the reasons Hebron is important because if I'm not mistaken, this is where King David officially became king and he was in Hebron. He wasn't in Jerusalem. Um, I don't know everything that didn't happen in Hebron, uh, but I know that there's been quite a few events there. I also believe that um, I spelled that wrong. I gotta make sure I look because I believe that Hebron is also. Just to show you the importance of Hebron. Um, go too far. Just to show the importance of Hebron. Um, I also know that. Yes, here we go. So I think Hebron is one of the sanctuary cities too where Israel is established. Um, somebody can let me know if they know. Um, I think it's one of the sanctuary cities when they establish Israel. For those of you who don't know, when they establish Israel in the 12 tribes move in. Um, yeah, Hebron was one. Uh, for those of you who don't know, when they established Israel, as when the tribes moved in, they had what you call sanctuary cities to where, say you killed somebody on mistake out in the field or something, and somebody was trying to kill you. If you were in the sanctuary city, they couldn't kill you until after you went through a trial. Um, it was a place of safety um, until trials and different things. Um, and Hebron is one. And I believe the part of the reason because Hebron was chosen to be one is because um, to an Israelite, Hebron would have been considered like the home of <clears throat> our patriarch. And we know that Abraham is revered all at all times, even when you get to the time of um, Hamashiach, which is roughly 2,000 years from Abraham. When you read the New Testament, a lot of times that that would be their claim to fame. Still, we the children of Abraham. How dare you talk to us about being servants and this and that and you just a man and we Abraham sees to the point that Hamashiach told him one time, 
Yah raise up Abraham's seeds out of these rocks, which is so important to today because a lot of would throw off Israelites today. I, I promise you, boy. I tell you, boy, the Bible really meant it ain't nothing new under the sun. Because when I hear some of the things these Israelites say today, it is so Pharisee. Because that's the same thing. Oh, we just see the Abraham. Can't nobody else do blah, 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 blah. Nah, that ain't true. But Mashiach constantly told you, you mean to see that. What he told him, if you was Abraham's son, you'd do it as Abraham did. Your, devil, your daddy is the devil. Because that's always been the thing. We the seed of Abraham. I believe that's why Hebron was chosen. Because it was known that Abraham was moving like this in this land. Any questions or comments on Joshua chapter 22 up until this point? Abraham. As we go through the patriarch. Now let me know. Would anybody like to read a few verses? <clears throat> from here. Yeah, I can read that. Uh, Thank you. Are we on uh, verse 14? 15. 15. And Abraham's brother, Nahor, and his father, and all belonging to them dwelt in Haran. For they did not come with Abraham to the land of Canaan. And children were born to Nahar, which uh, Milka, the daughter of Haran and sister to Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare to him. And these are the names of those that were born to him. Us, Buzz, Kimil, uh, Case that, Case that, Case that, uh, Pildash, Tiff, Fal, Bethel, uh, being eight sons, these are the children of Milka, which she bare to Nahar. Abraham's brother. And Nahar had a concubine, and her name was Rumah, and she also bare to Nahar Zimbach, Geshak, Tashak, and uh, my Ashak, uh, being four sons. And the children that were born of Nahar were 12 sons besides his daughters. And they also had children born to them in Haran. Now, hold on one second. It just detailed all the children, the sons that were born to Nahor. The reason why that's important is because every one of those sons would be a Hebrew. They would be... Um, all of those sons would be Abraham's nephews, just like Lot. The reason why I bring that up is because when you hear um, the word Gentile or heathen, by letter of the Bible, a Gentile or heathen is anybody not among, anybody not of the nation of Israel. These Hebrews, although Hebrews, from the line of Shem, they would be Shemitic people too, but they would still be considered Gentiles today. Verse 20. And the children of Uz, the firstborn of Nahar, were Abib, uh, Sheriff, uh, Gadian, Misloth, and uh, Deborah, their sister. And the sons of Buzz were Bakriel, Barachel, uh, Namath, uh, Sheva and Madanu, and the sons of Kimil and Aram and Rekoba, Rekob, and the sons of Kes were Achmelech, Namalek, Namalek, 
me uh Mishaya been on and Yephi and the sons of Chazo were Pildash, Meshach, and Oprah. The sons of Pildash were Aru, Shaman, Shaman, uh, Mirid, and Molach. The sons of Ty, uh, Tylef were uh, Mushan and Cushan and Mut, Mutis. The sons of the children of Bethel were uh, Sikar, Laban, and their sister, Rebecca. And that's important because now we understand where when Yaakov come through, this is how he got um, his wife. And Laban, this is his uncle. Um, um, or this is how Yitzhak gets his wife. And when, she's, and when she tells Yaakov, go to my uncle, we see this is Laban. He's born in, uh, up under Nahor, which is Abraham's brother. So, um, and I'm sure if we were to do a deep dive, we could find communities and kingdoms and all of that through history that have been attributed to all of these names. Um, I didn't go that far with it because it was quite a many, it was quite few. Um, but I know right off bat, Aram, I, I, if, if this is the Aram that I'm thinking of, this went on to be a nation. Um, I think Uz went on to be a nation. So I think this may be the Uz, if I'm not mistaken, where it said that Job was in the land of Uz. That's very possible. Um, I'm sure we could do that with all of them, though. Um, we can stop right there, Ak. Is there any questions or comments as we went through this lineage of Nahor, Abraham's brother, um, Abraham's nephews, um, a bunch of Israelites, actually? Anything anybody want to add to that? Okay. Um, I'll pick up 27. You can jump back in in a minute. Hold on. Uh, Joshua 22, chapter 27, it says, these are the families of the children of Nahor that were born to them in Haran. And Aram, the son of Kemuel, and Rechab, his brother, went away from Haran, and they found a valley in the land by the river Euphrates. So it's showing us that they went and built some kingdoms. Um, Aram and Rechab, I see your hand, um, Yahakana, what's going on? Shalom, everybody. I just wanted to ask about when you were reading just before, I, and I know I could too. Um, but when you were reading just before, when you said Malek was one of the sons, is that the Malek that everybody was worshiping or just a person named? That's a good question. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Because we know this name comes up again in the book of Amos as the God, and we just read that on Shabbat, and um, at this time, we, this time of Abraham and his life, we probably, man, a strong seven, eight, nine hundred years from, from near, so it might have, he might have went on to be some great man that people start worshiping, that's, that's, that's possible, and we know that they are in Haran, um, which is kind of like the Syria type of area, Turkey-ish, um, if you want to say that, I guess, um, give or take. Um, uh, so this is in the range for him to be somebody who maybe had got to be in worship throughout this land. It's possible. I said, you good? Yeah, that, I just had that question. Um, just when you guys, when you brought up, uh, who was it? Um, like Nimrod and all of that, I did that question popped in my mind, like, is this the mullet or just a person named mullet? But yeah, that answers it. Thank you. Hello. Hallelujah. No, it's, that's very possible. Even the Shiva, we know that when you get all the way to India, they have a, a, a god or a goddess. I'm one of the two. I don't know. They all kind of like a mix of things, but they have one named Shiva. 
who is to say that this person didn't travel there and become to be worshipped as a god? As we know, Nimrod became to be worshipped as a god. As many men that became to be worshipped. Uh, pharaohs in Egypt would be worshipped as god. So um, as we read about Osiris, he was he was the uh, the king in Egypt before the first pharaoh. Um, he goes on to be Ra, who they worship as the sun god. So uh, that's very plausible that many of these people went on to be worshipped as gods. Very much so. It tells us that two of these sons, Aram, the son of Kemuel, and Rechab, his brother, they went away from Aram and they found a valley in the land by the river Euphrates. And they built a city there and they called the name of the city after the name of Pethor, the son of Aram. That is Aram Naharaim unto this day. Let's see what this means. I'll give us a definition of it. Naharai. They give us something. Uh, this is calling us something else here, though. Elania is a Moshav in northern Israel, also known as Shajara, after the adjacent Arab village, Al Shajara. It was the first Jewish settlement in the lower Galilee and played an important role in the Jewish settlement of the Galilee. From his early years until the 1948 Arab Israeli War, it falls under the jurisdiction of Lower Galilee Regional Council and had a population of 490 and 219. So it's kind of, they're trying to say they believe they know where this city at, but I don't know. I see your hand again, y'all. I can know what's going on. Okay, before you read that, I was just thinking when it said you built the city there or they built the city there. And that it was that still that name until this day. I was thinking, is this that city that they found under the Euphrates? I don't think it gave a name for a city there, but it could be. Hmm. It could be. And like you, I agree. Every time I see in the Bible when it says something is unto this day, we may not know what it is. Um it may be buried underwater. But whenever I see that, I take that as y'all saying, I done preserved it and it's still right there. Now, you may not know. The name of it may done changed. And, you know, even some of these wells and altars, a lot of times it'll be like, that altar is still in such and such to this day. It's still there. It may be covered with trees and men don't know it's there or something. But it, I always believe when I see unto this day in scriptural terms, that's y'all letting us know that he has preserved it and it's still there. Hmm, that's very, very interesting. I would just now I'm curious as to if they found the name of what that city was. I don't, I don't know. They know. Had, I don't I don't I don't know. We have to look back into that. I don't recall if they had named it. Okay. Yeah. Verse 29. And the children of Cassid also went to dwell where they could find a place. And they went and they found a valley opposite to the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. We know Shinar was Babylon or Ur. We talking, we get, we see they moving west. This is an Iraqi region now. I believe the Euphrates from where they were in Haran would be wet or east, I should say. So we see these children of Nahor moving east, going towards what you would call your Afghanistans and, and India when you get far east from these places. Um, who was to say some of these <clears throat> Some of these children may be what who do people like the Chinese descend from? Who is to say? Um, because there are people who is hard to pinpoint their tribal history and the Chinese guard their history so closely, you really never know the true history of how all that came to be. Because China guards that very closely. So who is to say? But it's showing that they move in east. And we see another one built the city. And that's why I say many of those may have went on to have many big nations that um, I just can't put a finger on, but it's, it's definitely possible. It says, and they there, and they there built themselves a city and they called the name of the city Cassid after the name of their father. That is the land of Castium. I, I think I've heard of that somewhere else before. Yep, Ur Castium, commonly translated as Ur the Chaldeans is a city mentioned in the Hebrew Bible as the birthplace of the Israelite and Ishmaelite patriarch Abraham. In 1862, 
Henry Rawlinson identified Ercastium with Telel Makaria near Nasiria in southern Iraq. So they claim to know where this city is. And it's, it's in southern Iraq. So it's showing how, how they move in east here, um, which is important to state because who says that they stopped there? They could have very well been the people who populated the Indians, which is India, going down into when you get to China and the Japanese. And I could see those people being descendants of these people. That's very possible, which would make them Hebrews, although still Gentile. It says in, in oh, I'm sorry, that is the land Cassia them unto this day. So it's still there. And Casdium dwelt in that land, and they were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. And so it lets us know this nation grew to be big. This wasn't just like a family who took a plot of land and populated their family there for a time. This nation grew to be fruitful and multiplied, the scriptures say. So this grew to be something major. And Terah, father of Nahor and Abraham, went and took another wife in his old age. So Terah then took another wife. And her name was Pilia, Pilil, yeah, Pilia. And she conceived and bare him a son, and he called his name Zobah. And Terah lived 25 years after he begat Zobah. And Terah died in that year. That is the 35th year of the birth of Yitzhak. So I, I, knew, I knew Yitzhak was in his 30s. It tells us he's 35 at the death of Terah, which is in this time frame, give or take a year or two. And the days of terror were 205 years and he was buried in Haran. He was buried in Haran. He was buried where they were at with Nahor. Excuse me. And Zoba, the son of Terah, lived 30 years and he begat Aram, another Aram, Achilles and Marek. And Aram, son of Zoba, son of Terah, had three wives. So he had multiple wives, we see. And he begat 12 sons from his three wives and three daughters, 15 children total. And Yahuwah gave to Aram, the son of Zoba, riches and possessions, an abundance of cattle, flocks, herds, and the man increased greatly. So he became a great family as well. And maybe that's the Aram that, that I know if we study. I know that I've heard of an Aram as being a flourishing nation in this time. Maybe it's him, as we see his multiple Arams. But um, it's just letting us know that. Uh, um, by y'all telling us how they're increasing greatly is letting us know that th this ain't no little deal. These people to increase greatly mean that they increased in land because cattle and flocks, you need land, you know? So if you got an abundance of them, um, more than likely city slash nations that we have seen through history and we just searching back were probably attributed to these people. And we don't know how far east they went. Like I say, this could be, um, the Afghanis may trace back to this or the Pakistani, you know, or because we see they're moving east. Um, some of them, this Zoba, I don't, it don't even tell us exactly where he went and established cities, but it says in Aram, the son of Zoba and his brother and all his household journeyed from Aram and they went to dwell where they should find a place. But their property was too great to remain in Aram. But they could not stop in Aram together with their brethren, the children of Nahor. So it, they heard him and took over Haran. It's too many of them. Him and his descendants. Or his kids and his kids' kids, I should say. It says in Aram. And Aram, the son of Zoba, went with his brethren. And they found a valley at a distance toward the eastern country. So they went east too. And Aram, the son of... Think about the irony in this. None of them is going north. <laughs> they probably like, it's too cold up in Europe, man. I ain't, nah, we gonna go eat. <laughs> None of them is going south even into what would be considered the land of Ham to them. They going east. But that's what Yah has given the descendants of Shem as well, is what we would call Asia today, though. And Aram, the son of Zoba, went with his brethren and they found a valley at a distance toward the eastern country and they dwelt there. And they also built a city there and they called the name thereof Aram after the name of their eldest brother. 
So they called it, that is a Ram Zoba to this day. Let's see what they give us for Zoba here. Yeah. It says the region of the interior, Etria, I believe I pronounce it, are the prim primary geographical. Why are they thinking Zoba, Etria, anyway? But divisions through which Tria is administered, six in total, they include Central, Anzaba, Gosh, Barca, Bar Southern, Northern Red Sea, and Southern Red Sea regions. At the time of independence in 1993, Etria was arranged into 10 provinces. These provinces were similar to the nine provinces operating during the colonial period in 96. So it's, a, it's attributing this with Etria. Now, it must be stated that that's a part of East Africa. Exactly. Well, it's not a part of Ethiopia. I don't know if you would just say that to an Etrian. He might have a problem with that, but it is East of, it is in East Africa. Um, that's interesting. You know, that changes the dynamic of where they at. Um, and it's stated like that will be going into what would be Saudi Arabia too, but we understand that that area slash Yemen, all of that touch and all of that at a time would have been considered Northeast Africa um, also. So we see these children moving around. I gotta, guess I gotta see what this Aram mean because we keep calling these cities Aram such and such. Then it tells us that Aram was a historical region mentioned in early Kanuna forms. And in the Bible, the area of Aram did not develop into a bigger empire. It consisted of a number of small states in present-day Syria, northern Palestine. Some of these states are mentioned in the Old Testament, Damascus being the most outstanding one, which came to encompass most of Syria. Furthermore, Aram Damascus is commonly referred to as a simple, to as simply Aram in the Old Testament. Uh, so that gives us a dilemma a little bit there. Because it's talking about two different areas, but we just know as they as they break these nations down, I think the thing to take from this is that these became flourishing nations at a time. And like I say, the descendants of these nations may still be flourishing nations. We just don't know who all descends from what. Most most cultures, if you were to study cultures and, and histories of nations, they don't trace back this far, at least not in the history of themselves that they present to the world. It says in Yitzhak, the son of Abraham was growing up in those days and Abraham, his father taught him the way of Yah to know Yah and Yahuwah was with him. So it, it, we get right there, Yitz, Yitzchak is really how you pronounce his name, is a faithful man. He know the ways of Yah, he learned the ways of Yah, he know Yah and Yah is with him. And when Yitzchak, was 37 years old, Ishmael, his brother, was going about with him in the tent. So remember Ishmael to move back. So if Yitzhak 37 and Ishmael was 14 years older, he 51. And Ishmael boasted of himself to Yitzhak, saying, I was 13 years old when Yahuwah spoke to my father to circumcise us. And I did according to the word of Yah, which he spoke to my father. And I gave my soul unto Yah, and I did not transgress his word, which he commanded my father. So Yitzhak is saying, I follow what my father follow, which is interesting because Islam will tell you that it's the study of the lineage of Ishmael in so many words. They are related to Ishmael, I should say, but it's really the teachings from Mohammed, but they'll try to trace it back to Ishmael. At least that's what they'll say about themselves. But Ishmael is like, nah, I, I, I follow Yado. <laughs> and Yitzhak answered Ishmael saying, why do thou boast to me about this, about a little bit of, of thy flesh, which thou didn't take from thy body concerning which Yahuwah commanded thee? So now I got to say something here about Yitzhak. Because Yitzhak was circumcised too. He was eight, day, eight days old. He was a baby. Um, I have to say that being circumcised at 13, and being circumcised as a baby is a much different thing. <laughs> being circumcised as a baby, more than likely, you don't even remember that, right? Being circumcised at 13 had to be really painful and you would never forget it. <laughs> so I actually could see why Ishmael said that here. He's like, dude, you got circumcised, you was a baby. You don't even remember what it felt like. 
Well, I was 13, man. I was around here laying in the tent with pumps. We couldn't even get up. Because remember, it said that when, before the angels came, before they destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, when we read it in this, it said that Abraham was still recovering from the circumcision when the angels came to him and he feasted with them and they told him what they were going to do in Sodom and Gomorrah. So I can see what Ishmael's saying in, in this point here. He like, nah. You being circumcised at eight and me being circumcised at 13 ain't in no way the same thing because it was hard. <laughs> but I'm thankful I did it. You know, he's giving, trying to get a glory to God, but he's kind of boasting to, he boasting to Isaac like, you couldn't have handled that, man. You was, you know, I, I can see where this is going because that's a much different thing. Not saying that one is greater than the other, but that's a much different thing. I once, I, I once had a conversation with an Israelite. He was telling me how he knew some brothers who hadn't been circumcised and that they came into the truth and understood the covenant. Like he was talking about grown men in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s that he knew turned around and when they got circumcised as they came into the truth of Yah. And he was making a joke about it, but he was like, man, these old jokers be around here struggling to move, going to get circumcised as an old man. He was joking about it like, boy, it's so hard to get circumcised as a grown man. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I bet it is. <laughs> I bet it is. You having to get up and work still or do whatever you got to do. And you, what? That sounds hectic. So I could just hear Ishmael right here telling him, like, nah, what you did ain't nothing like what we didn't did as no grown men. You came, y'all. What's good? Well, shalom. Shalom, Mark. I, I remember um, <laughs> I used to work at this place called General Tire. And there was a guy there who had been... Um, having some problems, you know, with uh, being uncircumcised. So the doctor told him he just needs to get circumcised because, you know, um, I don't know, he's just having, you know, some skin issues and stuff down there. So I remember when he did it, man, he was like, man, he was really sore. They were giving him pain pills, but he said, man, it's just, you know, every move, you know, I could just, I remember, you know. <laughs> oh, definitely. And as a it baby, no you joke. get it done, you just laying around. <laughs> right. Yeah, you right. ain't doing nothing. You just laying around, man. It's, that it's a big. Hey, that's why I can. I don't know exactly what Ishmael was saying, but I can understand what he telling Yitzhak here. He like, dude, you got circumcised as a baby. That was so rough as a teenager. Right, man. Yeah, yeah, man. You know, you were you were saying some stuff about Hebron, and Hebron is 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 it's got a a lot of history to it. Like yeah. you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I got this uh, Zondervan's uh, Bible uh, dictionary, and it just helps with different things. Mm -hmm. And you were talking, were, were you talking about Haran, H-A-R-A-N? Were you talking about that city? That, that's where, well, you know, that's where Tara and Nahor stayed, and I believe that was mm -hmm. named, if I'm mistaken, that was named after Tara's other son, Haran, who died? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I was, you know, they got a picture of it in here, and it's got a whole bunch of these. I ain't never seen no beehives this big, mm. but these 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 huge mounds of beehives, a lot of beehives there, so there's a lot of honey there. I, it must, you know, that's what the pictures look like today. So I don't know what was going on back there. Now that would make sense because if you think about it, when when y'all established Israel in the twelve tribes, where they call a Haran would have fell within a tribe at that time, which would contribute mm. to the land of milk and honey. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good point, Art. Hallelujah. So Ishmael is boasting the Yitz Kyle, like, dude, you ain't been through what we've been through. Um, anything else anybody want to add up until this point as we get right here? Um, with about the circumcision or these cities. These cities are a study. You know, y'all can there's something to look into as we, you know, try to define some of these places. Um like I say, I didn't do a deep dive into these cities because it was too many, too many names. Um, I didn't want to get caught up into the lineage of Nahor, but just the way it's being described, these people could be anywhere. These people could be what we call a Saudi Arabian today. Um, these people could be, like I said, as they were, some of them go east from where they were talking about and talking about in the land of the Euphrates, this could be your Pakistanians or your Indians or any of those people going that way, your Mongols who came about later. Um, with Genghis Khan, I believe that's his name. Like their descendants, the Japanese, their descendants could be quite a few people. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ark, you know, you said, so I'm just going to jump in real quick about the, the geography and the stuff, you know, 
um, uh, you know, the, I got a, um, I don't know if it was, I think it was National Geographic. They did one as Bible maps. You know, the National Geographic about a $20 magazine. So I just went on and bought it, but it's got a lot of good maps in there. Just trying to learn the geography and learn what's east, west, what's north and south. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's really good to know that, you know, and I, I watched a little video about it and um, the geography. And one of the video was talking about how, you know, the reason that Israel was always kind of dealing with certain, certain things, because if somebody was going to go to fight in Egypt, they would have to kind of come through Israel. If Egypt was going to go, uh, back back east, they would have to come through Israel to get to, uh, you know, uh, to 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 get to uh, uh, Syria and and all of these other places, um, you know, Nineveh and all of these other places. They would they would bring their armies through there. So it was just one of those places that was centrally located. Plus, it was right on you know the Mediterranean. You know, mm -hmm. most definitely. Hallelujah. And that's a good that's a good point you made because you know there is debate about. Um, I shouldn't say debate, but there is conversation because everything had a debate. But there is conversation about Israel being where they say it is today, or it actually being deeper into Africa. Which, uh, to prove that it is there, it's a lot that has to move, and I, I think that's kind of where um, I think it's a worthy conversation because we just know that everything has been changed, so we have to assume everything has been changed, and it's worth a look into with the, on the same token. We have to mm -hmm. prove that everything has been moved. So let's just say we say the Sahara Desert was really Israel and they lied to us, right? Then we have mm. to prove where Babylon was at. We have to prove where Egypt was at. We would have to prove right. all of these other, yeah, we would have to prove mm -hmm. where Mount Sinai would be off, like at Mount Zion, like it, mm -hmm. so. And I, there's some I, people that some people, some people are making it their total. I mean, they, they're not talking about anything except where the land is. I mean, if you 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 can jump into some people's groups, and this this is all they talk about. Some people say it's America, you know. So it's it's, it's it's all kinds of all kinds of crazy stuff out there. That is a little bit much, but like I say, to your point though, it shouldn't be the only thing because the most important thing is to be able to walk back into this land one day, right? But with that being said, if you're gonna get into a study of it. You might have to make it to everything because you talk about a really big study. You have to prove where a bunch of things is at. And like even with America, because I've heard some people say that, well, America is really Israel. We were being brought back into the land. Now that don't go with scripture, but even with that's being said. So so like you have to you have to account for where is Babylon in? Where is Mount Sinai in if we hear? Where is um too many places? Like I'm drawing a blanket, so many that's running through my mind, but. It's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's a lot of places that you would have to account for. Um, and but I think mean, that's but, part of the study. And I think Hamashiach just wrapped it up in Matthew chapter five. He says, the meek inherit the whole earth. You don't have to really like get down with all that. He's just telling you, you know, it's your lifestyle that's going to be what is going to, going to get you the inheritance. You know what I'm saying? True. You know, don't worry, don't worry about, you know, you know, you, you, you're going to be directed where you where you're supposed to live. All of this stuff is in the direction. You come with a government on his shoulder. So, you know, he knows who we are individually. He knows if I'm Israelite blood or bloodline. He knows if I'm not, but he knows, you know, he knows all that. And all of that stuff will be organized when he gets here. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. I agree. It's just being ready when he get here. Um, it makes sense why in Isaiah it talks so much about y'all having to reteach us everything, language, name, you know, everything. Because, you know, it's a it's a worthy conversation, I agree. If 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 you you know that's the lane, though, know, because we we just know that so many things in this world are off. So I think it's a worthy conversation, but it's a it's a it's a very broad conversation when you get to when you go down that path though. Yahak and I, I seen your hand, it's on you, Koti. Oh, it's okay. I forgot to take my hand down. Shalom. All right. Oh, we at? oh, Ishmael is telling Isaac, you ain't did nothing. <laughs> you got circumcised as a baby, man. Get circumcised as a man. Verse 44 says, As Yahuwah lived, the Elohim of my father Abraham. 
If Yahuwah I should say unto my father, take now thy son Yitzchak and bring him up an offering before me, I would not refrain, but I would joyfully accede to it. So and we know Yah is going to ask him that. Um, Yitzchak, uh, he offered himself really though. And Yahuwah heard the word of Yitzchak, spoke to Ishmael, and it seemed good in the sight of Yah. And he thought to try Abraham in this matter. So we see Yah heard him and was like, okay, that's how you feel. Um, we're going to check it out. <laughs> I'm going to see, is you really standing on that? And you know, that goes back to even why Hamashiach would say, don't be saying things that you will do. You know, don't be making no oaths or even swearing by Yah if you're not going to do it because you, and he didn't even really just swear. He just speaking it to man, Ishmael. So what you got circumcised as a man? I ain't gonna give my life for this though. Is you willing to give your life for y'all? Which is actually a valid question today because it's a lot of, you know, we know script and we the seed of Abraham and you know we get ready for the feast. But like, we we have to be ready if the time calls. If y'all calls us for that to give our life for y'all, you know. Um, and y'all heard Yitzhak speaking that, and he was like, I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going to see. I'm gonna, I'm really trying in you because of what you said, but I'm also trying Abraham to see if he'll bring you. Um, and I always felt like after this story is when Abraham, um, although he's a faithful man, but I always felt like after the offering up of Yitzhak, uh, that this is when Abraham was like batting a thousand with y'all. Like not saying that he was slacking anyway, because we already see the way he moving. But this final test here is when y'all know this man will give me everything. Um, verse forty six is interesting. And see, this is why I say some it was some things that ain't said because it doesn't say this part in Genesis when you read this story. I don't even know if it say the part right there about Ishmael's and and Yitzchak's um, interaction, but I know it doesn't say forty six. It says. And the day arrived when the uh, when the sons of Elohim came and placed themselves before Yah, and Satan also came with the sons of Elohim before Yah. So now this is the thing, because you hear some people say that the sons of Elohim are men, um, the descendants of you know who live in righteous, um, however you want to put it. But when you see this here, who would that be if it were men? Abraham ain't there. Don't say he there. Who would this be? At this time, Shem and Eber, who would this be? And the day arrived when the sons of Elohim came and placed themselves before Yahuwah. And Satan also came with the sons of Elohim before Yah. And we know he says this again in Job. But even in the time of Job, we still like two, three hundred years from Job. Right. Well, now because you see 40. Esau, we're probably about 100, 150 years from Job at this point in Abraham's life, because if Ishmael is 37, close to 40, that means Abraham is 140 and he dies at 175 and he sees the birth of Jacob then before he dies. So I say we're in the range of about 100 years till you get to Job, maybe a little bit more, 150. Um, but Yah addresses him the same way he addresses him in Job, when Job chapter one and chapter two, when it says Hasatan comes amongst them, the sons of Elohim, it says, and Yahuwah said unto Hasatan, whence comest thou? And Satan answered Yah and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. That's the same thing he say in Job. And Yahuwah said to Satan, what is thy word to me concerning all the children of earth? And Satan answered Yah and said, I have seen all the children of earth who serve thee and remember thee when they require anything from thee. That's kind of the same way he was talking about Job. Man, Joe, he ain't follow you. You did anything for him. Let me touch him and see if he still follow you, you know? So, and this, and this also speaks about how Satan is the accuser because that's what he's doing. And when thou givest them the thing which they require from thee, they sit at their ease and forsake thee and they remember thee no more. We've seen this play out. In the stories of Nimrod, when it would talk about Yah would bless Nimrod to win these wars, Nimrod would never give Yah the thanks. He would give his idols the thanks, and then he started to build the tower. We've seen that exactly what he say here, you know. Um, verse 50, he says, has thou seen Ibrahim? That's really how that would be. Abraham would really be Ibrahim, the son of Terah, who at first had no children, and he served thee and erected altars to thee wherever he came. And he brought up offerings upon them, and he proclaimed thy name continually to all the children of earth. 
He said before he had children, he used to do all of this. And now that he has his son, Yitzhak is born to him, he has forsaken thee, which he hasn't done. I guess this goes to show how the devil will lie. He has made a great feast for all the inhabitants of the land and, and, and Yahuwah he has forgotten, which this is not true because it just told us where Yitzhak lived, not where Yitzhak, where Ibrahim lives or Abraham, everybody that come through, he would feed them, let them get water, let them wash up and clothe them and give them money for their travel. And it said that he made known the name of Yah to everybody who came through. So that's a lie, which Yah knows this is a lie. But it also shows how much the devil hate Abraham because he know. One thing about the devil, I, you know, people say a lot of things about who we call the devil. But one thing about the devil is he know. <laughs> he know Yah is choosing Abraham. The prophecy's already been set. So he know Yah has established the line through Shem, through Eber, through Abraham. He know. That's why, and we did this when we went through this. This is why Nimrod was so pent up on boasting that Terah was a part of his household and making Terah like second, third in command prince in all of Babylon. Because to them, that's to them through the devil, that's we have tarnished this line that Yah is trying to establish. It's following what we follow. But it didn't realize, even in that, with Terah following that. And it just shows you the power of Yah. He set apart Abraham, Terah's son, right up under his nose. Everybody ain't following, not the one I'm cuffing, you know? So this is a lie. We already see that Yah is teaching, um, not Yah. Abraham is teaching about Yah to everybody he interacts with. Shalom, Lord. I see your hand. And don't that remind you of what Hamashiach said? Those who are not willing to, you know, you love your mother or love your brother or your sister or your father more than me don't deserve me. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you see Abraham take take full stride. He goes in the house of his father's idols and beat them to puff just to show the father in so many words, I will go against my own father's house for you, father. There's no one on earth that I would not go against for you. And he followed it out completely to the point that, you know, his father didn't hate him, but I knew he had that feeling like, what have you done to go against my house? But Abraham was the, I, I'm not going to say like perfect, none of us perfect, but he served the father the way he was supposed to serve him. True. Not even just that, though, when he told, <clears throat> when Abraham would have told Tara that he changed his name. From Abram to Abraham would have been him letting him know that um, I'm not under the authority of my earthly father no more. I'm under the authority of Yah. That would have let him know that too. Because to tell him, he had to tell him, Yah told me change my name. <laughs> can you imagine that? Can you imagine those of you with kids over here? Can you imagine one day your child come tell you? Mind you, especially y'all who done put some real thought into your children's name, and he come tell you one day, yeah, I'm changing my name to such and such because y'all told me to. <laughs> now, you all, because you all following y'all, you may understand, but to the average person, they gonna hear that and be like, what? Like, we named you after your grandfather who did woo woo and So the, even in telling them his name changed, would have spoke that exact thing. Go ahead. That's funny you said that because like people um when they name you know when you give a name name holds power but when someone rename you or someone like give you a name it's power to the name to any name it's it's basically an authority it's also it's a meaning to the name your function so when he was changing it he changed Abraham's function like you're gonna function for me your father named you this. But his function, the fu the function that the name that your father gave you was not the function I want you on. So I always thought that was dope because like when you change your name or when you change something about yourself to, to meet the most high, you, you put on them new clothes. Hmm. Hallelujah. Almost definitely that it would be. It definitely would mean something when he told his father that it, you know. By this time, Terah had been humbled. They didn't have to run from Babylon. He living up here with Nahor. Haran and died. And they've seen the things that Yah's doing for Abraham. So even Terah might have been like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> At this point in the game when he told him that. But it, that definitely would have been a thing. Um, 
as the devil is, 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 is lying about him, you know? Um, verse 52, it says, for miss all that he has done, he brought thee no offering. He like, he ain't brought no offering. And we see that the devil's stumbling here too, because we know that in scripture, it says that Yah doesn't even really value the offering. He values obedience. See, that's what Abraham is doing. But the devil is trying to use that um, to accuse Abraham. He ain't brought you no offering. It says it multiple times in scripture. Yah says, man, these offerings is cool, but I value obedience. But the devil, like neither burnt offering nor peace offering, neither ox, lamb, nor goat, of all that he killed on the day that his son was weighing. And remember, they had the big feast. We talked about it. Shemnim was there. It was all kind of mighty men. They talked about princes there, kings. He like he sacrificed. They ate all that food. He ain't even sacrificed none to you. But he don't, that go to show that even the devil has lapses with Yah because Yah has stated in scripture, he don't care nothing about all that. No, he values obedience, and that's what Abraham doing. And Abraham is teaching everybody that come around him about Yah. Verse 53, even from the time of his son's birth till now, being 37 years, he built no altar before thee, nor brought any offering to thee, for he saw that thou didst give what he requested before thee, and he therefore forsook thee. Remind you, these sons of God is really the angels. And more than likely, this meeting is taking place in the firmament. Just so let me just get that out the way. Um, this isn't even happening on earth. That's why the devil said, I've been walking to and from, from the earth. He like, how you get up here? <laughs> he in the firmament because the angels can go to the firmament. They just can't go through the firmament, which is where heaven is. The firmament is the divide. Um, I don't believe man can get in the firmament. With all the space program talk, I don't believe man can get in the firmament. They call it a valley and a bell. Helen belt, belt or whatever they call it, like, nah, that's the firmament. So with that being said, I believe that this interaction is taking place in the firmament. That's why the devil said, I've been walking to and fro from the earth when he asked him how you get here. Um, the devil was in the firmament saying, and I believe this to be true today. Let me say that as well. I believe that the sons of God come to present themselves before Yah still, the ones that he've appointed to be down here on earth amongst us. And this, this, this interaction still happens in the firmament. Let me say that as well. Um, verse 54, it says, And Yahuwah said to Satan, Has thou thus considered my servant Abraham? For there is none like him upon the earth, a perfect and upright man before me. So we see, even though he's telling all these lies, y'all correct him. Nah, he perfect and upright. You tripping. I don't care nothing about no offering. He obedient. He ain't got to offer me none. He offering his life. And that's where we at. Because we not offering no animals. We ain't sacrificing nothing to Yah, not no animals in the physical sense. We offer in our life, which is what Yah wants us to do. Because to offer your life means that you be in obedience. He says, one, he's one that fears Yah. He avoid evil. We already see he do righteous judgment. He help the poor. He do all the things Yah say. He merciful and low, uh, show love and kindness. All the things that Yah say value, Abraham show all the traits. And he says, as I live, were I to say unto him, bring Yitzhak thy son before me, he would not withhold him from me. Much more if I told him to bring up a burnt offering from before me from his flock or his herds. And Hasatan answered Yah and said, speak then now unto Abraham as thou hast said, and thou will see whether he will not this day transgress and cast aside thy word. Which is the same thing he said about Job. Job didn't. Abraham didn't. But this just go to show you. Um, and this is something to be mindful of, too. Hasatan ain't going to accuse sinners before Yah because he already got them and he know it. He going to accuse those who uh, Yah has set apart. So as even all of us, um, being people who are following Yah and trying to grow, grow deeper in the word of Yah and whatnot, we always have to be on guard and know that. I, 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 certain people around me locally I always tell Hasatan is not going to let you come into this truth of Yah easily. And that's part of the trial and tribulation. Um, Yah is using him to try us. That's the spiritual war, right? Um, are we going to stay faithful to the end, though, is the question. And he's given us examples. This example is not even in scripture, at least in what we would call the book of Genesis, a bare sheet. They, this story isn't told. It's, the story is told exactly like this, but this interaction with Yah and Hasatan about uh, 
Ibrahim or Abraham. It's not in there. But I think this is an important story so that we know that yeah, Satan and tried Abraham, he tried Job. He definitely accused it and trying us, man. Well, Andre Steele, man. Hey, you know what he come from, man. You feel me? Put the put the right amount of money or the right woman in front of him. He a break bad. I know he's speaking that about me. That's why I'm battling for my soul every day. And I'm sure all of you got something that he could try all of you with. Uh, and it may be even more simple than that. Uh, try your came y'all's anger. I remember I once told me he used to be angry, man. And I remember last time we talked, he was like, man, I don't even be studying none of that no more. Hallelujah. <laughs> you feel me? But that's the accuser. Try such and such lust for whatever or money or, you know, anything. We all have different things. Um, and this is a testament that, that Hasa, like I say, if Hasatan saying this about Abraham, if he did this to Job, mind you, Job being Esau, they say, he ain't even Israel. Be that as it may, because he would be a Gentile. <laughs> but be that as it may, he trying us. That's the point. And it's showing he'll do it with anybody. That's actually a good thing. If you being tried in this manner, because that's showing that Hasata feel like he'd have lost his grip on you. And we got to fight to the end. Um, and we got to be obedient to the end. We see Abraham, he's going to be, you know, for those who know the story, um, Abraham's going to be obedient to the end. Yo was obedient to the end. Um, he even tempted a Mashiach, like prime example. Prime example. When Hasata went, and tipped it a Mashiach after he was baptized in the 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness and whatnot. More than likely, there was another interaction like this. And when the sons of God went to present themselves before Elohim, he told them, man, you say that's your son. He unblemished. Let me all let him. And to show you how much Hasatan was trying to corrupt a Mashiach, he personally went <laughs> and tried to tell a Mashiach. He didn't even like change forms or send a spirit or he personally went and tried to trip him up in scripture. Man, don't the Bible say, well, what? Hamashiach was shooting him down. No, the word actually say. No, the word actually say. He personally went. So let this be a note to you. That's what I see is, is, is probably the, the most important takeaway from this chapter is here at the very end. Asatan is trying on to pull out all the stops. And he ain't doing it for the for the center because he feel like he got the center. He doing it for whoever he feels that Yah has set apart who actually being righteous. And we gotta, that's why the scriptures say endure to the end. I seen somebody hand go up, I'm not sure, but uh, it's on you, whoever it was. No, I was just gonna say, yeah, the father did that. Well, not the father, sorry, half the time. I'm coming out to the children. Like all, all the greats, not even greats, but people who are um, did great works under the father. It was like hunted down almost. Moshe, Abraham, like a bed was on their head. Even Hamashiach, king said, fine, find that baby, but like, kill it. And that remind me of basically how Hasatan is. He tried to kill him at birth. Then when it didn't work, he tries to get them as children. When it doesn't work, then he tries to get them at adulthood. When it doesn't work, he still tries. He tries to hug their whole period of life. Because mm -hmm. even with this story with Abraham, later on, he still creeps in the house. I say that through the fact of this man. Mm -hmm. He still creeps in by different ways just to say, hey. And then Abraham has to overcome it. And then you see Jacob, you see Isaac. Isaac doing the same thing um, going down the line. But it just seems as if the house of time have always been after the main people of the father because he knows that he cannot pluck them out of his hand. John says in chapter, I think it's John 15, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But it might be in John 15 where he says, you know, you cannot pluck these out of my hand. Once they're rooted in y'all, no one can pluck, you can't, no one can come and pluck you out. You have to pluck yourself out. So house of time almost like, let me, let me go try him. I, he's going to curse you. He's going to do this thing. Even though y'all know the future, he's like, no, he's not, because he's faithful. And those people, I believe, are the ones that the Father speak of saying they cannot be plucked out of his hand. Hallelujah. No, that's the battle. Um, and it is a lifelong battle. Um, 
It definitely is. And that's why we have to do it to the end. And that's why the way we raise our children is very important. Um, from this day forward, you know, some of us have already had children before we even understood. And that's, you know, that's just something to pray about to the Father. But from this day forward, uh, no matter how it turn out, and, you know, we, we do it to the best of our abilities. We stay, we try to, you know, we present it in, in, in you know, the most compassionate way that we can, but it has to be presented that we got to do better um, by the covenant. And that's why, you know, what we see going on here in America with our people today is so, um, it sticks out so much because from us losing this and teaching the ways of the world to our children as the way uh, we see that the children who we believe to be the children of Israel, they can't stand to bear it. It's done broken our people down. And like I say, Hasatan know he got them. At least now he believes he has them because we know that Yah will take anybody back. Case in point, myself and whoever else believe that about themselves. But he also see those who running around now talking about something. I ain't doing none of that no more. I know he see us. I know he see me. And this is why the scriptures say we got to endure to the end. Remember that Hasatan is always accusing us. That's why you got to be on guard against you know, to the best of your abilities, you know, put your best foot forward with the most high yeah every day. Anything else anybody want to add? Next week is going to be a long chapter two because that's when we actually going to go through him going up here to sacrifice Yitzhak. And it's a few things in that story that didn't make Genesis either, which stand out um, and are really important in my guesstimation of it all. Let me see if we when you get to Genesis 22, it just says, and it came to pass after these things that Elohim did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son. See, it doesn't even give us this interaction between the devil amongst the angels, more than likely in the firmament, because they ain't meeting on the earth. Um, it just gives us that, um, we see that um, that interaction ain't there. In Genesis, that's something that Jasher adds a detail to. And also we see that, and this is why I say the sons of God can't be righteous men because Abraham is the most righteous man on the planet at this time, outside of Shem. I think Shem's still alive. He was just, well, it's been 30 some years since Yitzhak was Wayne. Shem might have passed on. I can't remember if it told us Shem passed yet. I know I said Eber passed, I think. But Abraham is, if not the most righteous outside of Shem and Eber possibly, He's close to the most righteous. And if the sons of God were men, then Abraham would have been present there at this meeting. And we know that Abraham wasn't present because it says, Yah comes to Abraham and he says, take now thy son Yitzhak. You know, he comes and tells him what the interaction is. And even in the next chapter of Jasher, it says the same. When we start the next chapter, it says, at that time, the word of Yah, which we know to be Hamashiach, came to Ibrahim, and he said unto him, Ibrahim, and he said unto him, Ibrahim, and he said, here I am. So after this interaction, Yah comes to tell Yitzhak what was going on, and that kind of goes against that study, unless you say that Abraham wasn't one of the sons of God, which at this time in the world, that's highly doubtful, because it ain't that many righteous people, well, I don't know who are righteous in the world, but Yah has specifically spoke to us, the people who he see righteous. Shem, Ibrahim, Abraham, Yitzhak. We just heard Ishmael say he been following Yah. Um, and we're going to see how those stories go forward because it's going to be some play with all of that. All Everything's in play. <laughs> Everything is in play right now. Next chapter is really long. It's like 90 verses. We may have to break that in two. I didn't know it was so long. But hallelujah. Anything anybody want to add or take away from any of this before we go? It was another good read, man. Endure to the end. That's what y'all telling you at the end of this. Endure to the end because all the way until you die. Mind you, Abraham 140. We When we seen the birth of Abraham, it said that Abraham was dedicated to y'all all his days. He 140 years old. And even after 140 years of being a follower of y'all all his life, Hasatan still accusing him <laughs> to the father. 
that lets you know until you take your last breath. You got to be on guard. Guard these commandments. What does it say? I mean, but think about it. I wish my occulty was here. We have it to having a discussion from the beginning. Really, this is what was said in the beginning. When you think about it, this actually is. I'm gonna miss this. This actually was what y'all said in the beginning, because he told him. He told Adam, he said. Uh, told Adam. Oh, Genesis 2 15. It says, and the most high Yah took the man, Adam, and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, right? To dress means what? To serve, to teal, to worship. As well as, you know, the physical aspects, but spiritually, he told him to, to go in there and serve Yah. This is your purpose in life, Adam. In the garden, I'm going to provide everything. You just got to serve me. But to keep it is what? To guard, to protect. So really, as Yah's asking us, and after 140 years, what he asked in Abraham is the same thing that he told Adam in the beginning. Go dress the garden and go keep it. And we're going to have to guard this word, preserve it, save it, be a watchman. You have to stay on point because we see even 140 years in, Hasatan still work. He like, all right, let Abraham go. Like, you would think he'd be tired. Like, you know what? I'm just going to work on Isaac and the rest of them. Abraham ain't going. It's been 140 years. I still ain't got him to trip up. He's so mad at Abraham, he went and told a lie because it told us right before there's multiple things that he lied about. But y'all knowing he lying, but y'all also know the heart of Abraham. All right, I know you lie, but okay, we're going to see. I know what he going to do, though. He'd have been too faithful to, to th thus far. You talk about sacrificing animals. What? That man sacrificing himself every day. And let that be encouragement to all of y'all. Hallelujah. <sighs> if there's nothing else to be said, would anybody like to pray us out? It's on you. If anybody like to pray us out, I'll pray us out, though, if don't nobody want to. Hey, I can okay. pray us out. Go ahead. All right. So, so hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to put our, put our hearts and minds uh, and I'll be out right now. Father, yeah, we just want to, uh, first and foremost, just say, uh, told our rabbi for the word that went forth and studying Jasher and just the uh, comments that were made. Father Yah, uh, to, to further glorify you and to bring uh, some enlightenment to the reading of your word, Father Yah, we just want to thank you for um, all the wonderful things that you've done in our lives, Father Yah, for the providence that you've had over our lives and guiding us uh, without us even knowing. Father Yah, now we just ask that you got us uh, so we can uh, be worthy of the righteousness which you bestow upon the saints, those that... Uh, study your Torah and that want to take hold of the covenant. Father Yah, right now, we just want to um, uh, just say thanks for uh, all the wonderful works that you've done for uh, Koti Lauren. We've been praying for her and CJ. Father Yah, we're thankful that, you know, the operation went, went safely and asked that, you know, he just continues to heal up and just uh, CJ because, uh, continues to be strong, remain strong, Father Yah. Uh, just want to pray uh, for, you know, uh, a lot of our family members been sick. Father Yah, ask that your healing presence be in the midst. Um, I just want to uh, also just ask for forgiveness for our sins, any of our transgressions, any of our trespasses that we may have uh, made knowingly and unknowingly, Father Yah, and just once again, um, acknowledging the sins of our forefathers. Uh, you know, right now, we just want to uh, just thank you for the mercifulness that you bestowed upon us, the loving kindness that you've shown us, and uh, just being, just once again, being with us when we didn't know you, Father Yah. We may have thought we we, we knew you, but uh, we're thankful for the opportunity to know you on a more intimate level. I thank you for using uh, Andre as a vessel to bring forth your word tonight once again, Father Yah. And I just ask that for the rest of this week, uh, we all may face obstacles, I'll be out, but let us just be reminded that we have our Father, which is in heaven that can bring us through uh, anything, Father Yah, for uh, there's nothing of this world that we can't overcome uh, with, without, uh, you know, with the faith that, uh, was provided by Yahushua Mashiach and blood, which was shed uh, for us to be reconciled back to you, Father. So we thank you. We love you in the name of Yahushua Mashiach. So be it. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
Yes. Shalom, everyone. Yes. Lay the toe, everybody. Shalom. Hallelujah. Everybody have a good night. Good seeing you all. You too. Shalom. 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 Shalom.